We have not one, not two, but one, two, three, four, five speakers up here. Don't worry, we'll keep it short. We're not each going to go on for an hour. Um, but thank you all for coming to our panel on peripheral data projects, data that is in, outside, near, or alongside OpenStreetMap. Uh, so uh, we're all involved in a number of different open source and open data projects that are connected in with OpenStreetMap. And, and thought it would be a good idea to chat about some of the similarities and differences among our projects and kind of the reasoning behind why we're building these projects that aren't part of OSM proper and the OpenStreetMap core, but uh, are very tightly connected in both technically speaking and in terms of community involvement. So I'm just going to set the stage with a couple remarks. And then each one of the panelists will give a little introduction to their project, speak a bit about uh, how it integrates with OSM technically and community-wise, and then we'll have some time at the end for discussion, for questions, and um, we'll, we'll have time for questions from you all as well. So just to set the stage, uh, isn't OSM big enough for everything under the sun? It has a very large data model, very flexible. It has an even longer API doc. And to go with each of these bits of technical functionality, there's a mailing list, or three mailing lists. Uh, so shouldn't there be room for, for everything within OSM proper? Some of the problems and the topics that we and some of our colleagues and our collaborators have been tackling uh, don't exactly fit this model. Uh, we've been doing bulk imports. Sometimes that's a four-letter word. Uh, but bulk import can also mean federating authoritative data. Uh, and, and while OSM has a real emphasis on community contributions, there's also value in authoritative data sets, not just as a one-time import, but as a continual uh, process and a continual aggregation. Uh, also say ephemeral data like uh, traffic or the use of, of infrastructure, things that are not base map but are, are relevant to how that infrastructure is used. Uh, the OpenStreetMap data model is very flexible but there are other types of objects it doesn't represent very well like uh, 3D models. Uh, so out in the, in the lobby area at the MapZen table we've got some nicely printed out 3D models of Manhattan, and you can see both what the OpenStreetMap data model allows for in terms of extruded polygons and the things it doesn't allow for in terms of uh, 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 curves and roofs and things that uh, 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 you can certainly represent a polygon in other ways, but not, not within the OpenStreetMap data model. Photographs and imagery and temporal data are all other things that we all are interested in that don't fit exactly within the OpenStreetMap universe. So among the five of us up here, uh, we've got a number of projects we're going to speak about. I'll let each one of the panelists introduce themselves and uh, tell you a little bit more about their background. And these are the questions we're going to consider. We're going to think about why, in the case of these projects, was it relevant to create something new from OSM proper? How do these projects integrate technically with OSM in terms of ID schemes, APIs, uh, editing, tooling, and data pipelines? And how are these projects connected in with the OpenStreetMap community, uh, both in terms of, of people, but also in terms of things like user accounts or, uh, or legal issues? And uh, I'll be curious to see how many of these pattern, these, these, these things are patterns among all our projects and maybe, uh, maybe patterns that we'd like to share with other projects in the future. So with that as background, let me hand over the mic to, uh, to Ian Dees, who's going to talk about the Open Addresses project. Excuse me, Rich. Hi, everybody. My name is Ian. Um, I started, I suppose, I helped start Open Addresses 
Io, uh, which is a project designed to store uh, and collect uh, address data, open address data from around the world. Um, my background is that uh, I graduated from college and was in need of something to do with my spare time, so I went to OpenStreetMap. And uh, 10 years later, I've, I'm still working on it. Um, <laughs> uh, I started open addresses because I spent a lot of my time trying to um, in, import data into OpenStreetMap and met resistance rightfully uh, in some cases. And um, I, I needed a spot to keep track of where I was uh, making progress in collecting open data that didn't involve uh, uh, causing uh, ripples in the fabric of OpenStreetMap community. Uh, so I started this other project to keep track of that. Hello, I'm Diana. I work for Mapsen, um, and I'm relatively new to the geospace. I started at Mapsen about five months ago, and until then I had just been a software engineer in other various industries. Um, and so when I started at Mapsen, one of my first projects was to evaluate the um, quality of the administrative data within OpenStreetMap. What's it? Oh. Uh, within the OpenStreetMap data. And so part of that meant that we were going to extract that data on a regular basis and make that publicly available for download. And so that just launched um, today, actually. And um, we're excited to make that available. And basically, the idea is to isolate these subsets of data. And then this way, it makes it easier for people to evaluate the quality of that data, to fix it where it needs to be fixed, to fill in the gaps. Um, and then feed that back into OSM, and then every time we do the extracts, which will be monthly, um, those changes will be reflected in the data set. Um, and doing that kind of evaluation and just quantifying those subsets of data is very difficult when you're looking at the large planet file. And so creating these extracts is something that we think is going to be really helpful for the community. And this is just the beginning, and we're looking at other data sets that could be interesting to be extracted in such a fashion where it's a regular um, extract and is available separately. We also do Metro Extracts, which is, um, has been really popular in the community, and that's just slicing the planet file um, into regions that are cities, countries that people are interested in. Um, and that's been one of our more, more popular offerings, I guess. It's, it's out there if you want to check it out. Um, so pass it along. <clears throat> Hi, I'm uh, Jan Eric from uh, Mapillary. We are a uh, small startup. Uh, we crowdsource Street View, which means uh, that our users, uh, most of them use smartphones. They walk around, bike around, drive, and use our app to take photos. The photos are then combined between users across time, stitched together into uh, Street View, essentially. And uh, the whole reason for this is uh, to be an independent source outside of the bigger mapping silos and to fix the, the crappy coverage that you can see today from, from mapping vans. Uh, so anyone who wants better coverage can go out and map their, uh, their, the areas that they care about. Um, and so, yeah, I started in my hometown that doesn't have Street View, uh, and I mapped it in two weekends with a bike, and it's, it's, it's fairly easy. Um, and so we're, we're not from the mapping space initially. We're computer vision people. So... Um, Extracting information from the images, stitching them together, uh, creating 3D data is, is what we do. And so the screenshot here shows traffic sign recognition and, uh, and some sample photos from Germany. Uh, I guess we'll talk more about the rest then. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeremy Monto, and I'm the co-founder and CTO of a company called Trailhead Labs. And we um, have been very involved in a project called Open Trails, which is an open data standard for parks and recreation types of information. Um, I talked about it a little bit earlier today. Did anybody catch that? Anybody in here now? Yeah, cool. Uh, I, won't, I won't go into it in the same detail, but, but basically, um, you know, we, uh, we've been working with parks and recreation agencies for a number of years um, on helping them publish their data, get their data out into the world in a way that's useful to park visitors, and they have a number of challenges with that today. Um, open trails, um, you know, when we, when we became involved, really addressed this need for them to have a, 
already defined um, format for the agencies to agree, to agree upon for you know, when they want to collaborate with each other or collaborate with the developer community. Um, and so we've been um, doing as much as we can to push, push that forward and, and let people know about it and um, try and, and, and work with the various communities around parks and recreation data and getting people outside because um, that's our mission is to, to get more people outside and get new people outside. And um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And my name is Drew Dara Abrams, and I'm with MapZen. Um, and at MapZen, we've been building a service called TransitLand uh, that's for aggregating and bringing together public transit-related data. Uh, so public transit involves both geographic and temporal data, so knowing where the routes are and where the stops are, but also when they're served. And uh, so with this project, we found that OSM handles the geographic component of transit very well, uh, but not so well does it handle the temporal component. So uh, the timetables for bus schedules, uh, calendars like knowing uh, Monday the, the whatever if is a holiday schedule. Uh, these are the kinds of things that uh, don't fit very nicely into say an OSM tag. So that's why we've created this separate project that connects together with OSM data. So it's not, not its own silo, uh, but, uh, but also not trying to cram the temporal data of transit into an OSM tag. Uh, so that's, that's the project I'm representing on this panel. And now that we've done brief introductions, I'd be kind of curious to hear from everyone uh, a little bit more about the nitty gritty of how your projects connect into OSM, either touching an API, using an ID scheme, uh, or if you're just making use of OSM tiles and that's the touch point. Um, so curious to hear both the good and the bad. Anyone want to go first? I guess the answer is easy for my project. It's basically extracting the data directly from OSM. And so, um, yeah, there's not much to it. We do a monthly, the plan is to do a monthly extract. It runs automatically. So any updates that happen um, will get picked up. And the data represents what is in OSM, except it's in GeoJSON format. Um, so that's how we're tied to it. So open addresses does not really connect too much with OSM right now. Uh, there, I think where we touch is where uh, the community kind of comes together around open data. Uh, a lot of the people who are interested in the same sort of open data e things are uh, both in open addresses and in open street map. I think our, our commonality is uh, trying to make open data a thing with normal people and um, making it accessible and interesting. Um, on a more practical sense, open addresses does, it did uh, come out of the desire to import data into OSM. And at some point in the future, I hope somebody spends the time to take the data that we have and put it into OSM, but it's not happening right now. But it would be a very easy thing to do if somebody were to take that hint, hint. All right. Um, for us, it's we're not using any OpenStreetMap data uh, yet. That might change. Uh, but the other way, um, we're allowing OpenStreetMap to use any of our data for editing maps. Uh, so that would be our images, all of the data we extract from the images, like traffic signs and things like that, uh, connections between images. We're integrated in the ID editor. Uh, there's a JOSM project over the summer, so hopefully everyone can get access so the street level imagery tab or layer in ID comes from Mapillary. Um, so we're very much connected in the sense that we want to push as much content and make it available for OpenStreetMap, but we're not consuming any OpenStreetMap data yet. And of course, there's an overlap of, of user base too. Um, um, so we. We do a lot of stuff with OpenStreetMap as a company. Um, OpenTrail specifically, 
um, it, you know, was designed uh, as a standard from the very beginning, um, thanks to sort of who who started it and where it came from, um, to to be uh, interoperable with OSM in a variety of ways, which I, I think has really helped Open Trails um, become adopted and, and and be sort of and, and grow. So we. Um, in our product, we we're, we're trying to uh, come up with ways to make it really easy for people to become OSM editors um, or just become more engaged with OSM. So we do we connect uh, via OAuth and are, are starting to do some some sort of publishing that way. Um, in Open Trails, really for us, it was exciting because it represented an opportunity to help improve something that we had been using for a long time. And we, you know, we were always kind of looking for a way to to give back, and and this seemed like a way that we could do that, but also really helped us, honestly, as a business to to tell park agencies, hey, there's an option now for getting your data out there um, that could be public domain, but it also benefits from being an open data standard and everything that comes with that. And then, hey, guess what? It's kind of designed to be interoperable with a bunch of other stuff, including OSM. So this could be a way to potentially get your authoritative data over to OSM and that's been that's been you know so I mean it's very early but signs are good on on that working out potentially so um, you know we do a lot of a lot of things with OSM and those are those are kind of the things that I think are most exciting are those opportunities where a commercial product can help improve OSM so uh, and we're doing that by supporting open trails and and talking about open trails And in terms of uh, technical integration of transit land with OpenStreetMap, uh, we, ha we effectively do a crosswalk between IDs. So we have our own ID scheme for, for stops, for routes, for transit agencies. And then OSM has its IDs for, for nodes and ways. And uh, we've, we will take a stop on our side and conflate it with an OSM way, say what's the closest way to a, a stop? Uh, we store that in our data store and serve it out on our API. And then likewise, our IDs uh, f could fit very nicely into OSM tags. So our, our goal is to um, have loose connections, uh, have a crosswalk so that users can uh, move back and forth between data sets, but effectively never have to raise the, the question of a bulk import one way or the other. So speaking of bulk imports, I heard one, one wish from, from Ian. I'm curious to hear if other panelists have a wish list item, either technically or community-wise, that, that could maybe help your project be better integrated with OSM or maybe open up some more possibilities. It's funny because we, you know, we've been sort of circling around the OS community for a long time and, and just, you know, from a consumer of the data and, and just trying to start to understand the community and, and sort of the, the issues around licensing and everything. And really, we're not trying to come in and try and say, this is how it's got to be, trying to prescribe something. And same thing on the park agency side. We work with a lot of park agencies that have um, existing processes and we're really trying, we're excited because it looks like open trails could be a way to not necessarily put those kinds of demands on, on the community and, and, and try and be a, br a bridge between those things and I mean I think a lot of the discussion around licensing and, and, and the other issue are great but you know we're still, we're still pretty early as being a you know an involved part of this community, so we're excited to just kind of be an intermediary to a certain degree and understand what the issues are on on the on the OSM side or any other community for that matter. And then what are those is issues with park agencies and how can various technologies or standards sort of be a go between? So we don't have any specific wishes except that um, the community just continue to be as receptive as they have been to hearing other communities. Um, either issues or just challenges with working with OSM. So just keep on, you know, talking and having an open mind to this stuff because I think some really exciting things are about to happen in a lot of different ways. 
Yeah, uh, like I said earlier, we're not using OpenStreetMap uh, today, but we're starting off a project now over summer on routing. Routing using photos, meaning that you can ask for how to get from A to B with good photos in the direction along that route. Or, uh, as may be the case, case for us and our users, uh, get a route from A to B that doesn't have photos where we need to go and capture. Uh, so that would be the first integration where we're mixing uh, OpenStreetMap data uh, and then our GPS traces and photos and we do a little map matching between them. And uh, so after summer we'll know, but I think that's an exciting project where the two data sets will blend. Um, I don't think that we have any wish lists right now for OSM itself. Um, I think we're just wishing that the community starts using these extracts and that that leads to discoveries of holes and missing data or invalid data. Um, and so that people kind of just feed that right back into the OSM data set and it'll help fix everything in the admin data. I kind of already answered. Oh. I kind of already answered this, but I, I think um, my wish would be that uh, OSM continues being awesome and uh, kind of spreads spreads that awesomeness around to these other organizations. Um, and when you're bored tracing the outlines of buildings, consider also searching for open data in your area or mapping a trail instead of a, a building or something like that. So um, just I, I think for me, the interesting part is that there's all these other projects out there that are very similar to what OSM is already doing and are very compatible with the OSM community should use them. So not to go into this in too much depth, but I'm curious to hear if any of you all have had um, successes or failures with licensing issues. Any licensing issues with data peripheral to OSM? So one of the sticky points with open addresses is that we, uh, we leave the worry about licensing up to the person, the consumer of the license or of the data. Um, so that means that it's kind of annoying as a, a data consumer of open addresses because you have to go in and read about what the license is and understand the risk if you feel there is any. And, uh, and understand that. And I think um, for our project, licensing in general is kind of a an annoyingly complex thing. And I, and I think uh, if you were ever to create open data or to ask your local government official for open data, like you should be doing always and forever, you, sh you should be asking for uh, data to be released in a format or in a with a license that's specified and very open and liberal. Um, preferably even just CC by or CC zero or something like that. Something that uh, is specified so that there is no ambiguity about what uh, is going on with the licensing. Yeah, we're, we're in kind of a funny situation with, with licensing since we, you know, a large component of what we do is is open data and encouraging open licenses and trying to remove as much as that question mark as possible for when, like, people want to come and, and, and use the data. They don't have to, like, necessarily worry about licensing. They can just know that they're going to be free and clear to do what they want with it. I mean, that, that's one aspect of it. But, you know, we... We work with a lot of, um, you know, our customers are governments. Um, most, a lot of the time we work with nonprofits as well, but, you know, governments specifically, they're going to have like some very specific requirements and sometimes we can, um, you know, talk through parts of it, but sometimes it's just, hey, you know, it's, stuff's got to be public domain. So, you know, we're navigating that and just trying to understand as best we can what the issues are and trying to educate both sides. and. Um, you know, so far so good. I anticipate it's just going to be a thing that we have to worry about for a while. And, you know, we've got, you know, we're, we're trying to build a business too. And so we're always trying to figure out what, you know, parts of the data that's not in the open trail set do we lay, you know, a license on. And, and we're sort of, uh, you know, we're not coming down hard yet and, um, on, on, in, any, 
anyway, but I, it's just something that we, we spend time thinking about and um, uh, the less time we have to think about it, the better, but the other side of that is we can, we feel like we can be pretty helpful with kind of navigating those issues as, as, as much as we can, so. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add on, in terms of transit land as a project, we're in a similar situation to open addresses of aggregating transit data that's provided by many different uh, public agencies that all attach their own licenses and terms to those data sets. Uh, so uh, each one is its own license, each one has its quirks, and then when you multiply them out, uh, the pros and cons of each license, um, um, it, it, it's, there are a lot of combinatorial possibilities, let's just say. Uh, so I think open addresses, transit land, and some of these efforts to aggregate authoritative public sources uh, do, do run into some issues uh, and some challenges there. Is that a question? Yeah. Hi, my name is Gavin Treadgold. I'm from New Zealand. Um, specifically more about um, open address was a quick point I wanted to make. I noted when the map first went up that New Zealand was a nice green colour and I thought, aha, I know why. And sure enough, I had a quick look at the data. Um, in New Zealand, we, the government's been making a good effort over the past five or ten years or so to create a framework for the release of Crown information. And that's the new NZ Gold project, which is a government agreement on licensing, which basically says unless it needs to be private, it should, be, should go out um, under Creative Commons licensing, basically. And so this has spawned a number of data provision services, including the LINs, um, which is where that address is, the addresses have come from for New Zealand. And so that's about as close as you're going to get to a good authoritative addressing in New Zealand. Um, the second, and this is more a question, um, you're, you all talked about getting data for a number of different sources, different quality, different licensing. Have you actually been marking up in the metadata the quality and the licensing of the data that you've been using, or has it pretty much just been thrown in and left there for the user to sift through all the, the different aspects of it? Thanks. So, so just to repeat for the recording's sake, uh, a comment and a question, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, New Zealand's uh, taking a national effort to, uh, to standardize on, uh, on some Creative Commons licensing. Uh, and and this may be making addressing data uh, available in a standardized way. Uh, and then a question of uh, whether these types of projects are, are, are including metadata that can actually help users make sense of licensing con constraints, uh, but also uh, the, the accuracy and the uncertainty of those data sets. So open addresses, uh, the, the whole uh, source file JSON blob thing that we run off of, one of the keys is the license, and it's usually a link to a document to some page somewhere. Uh, sometimes it's just a word, sometimes it's not there. So uh, we do keep track of that metadata, and sometimes it's not obvious or correct, uh, but we're trying to make that better. Or sorry, it's almost always correct when it's there, but um, sometimes it's not there. Um, and then same thing with accuracy. We, we source our data from different places. Uh, some of it is parcels that we take centroids of. Some of it is uh, data, data that came from a place that came from another place. And so we have different levels of accuracy that we keep track of. And um, with the goal there being so that if we overlap data from one provider and another provider, we could pick the one that's more accurate in theory. Um, so we do keep track of that kind of stuff. Um, and it's all human entered, so of course there's error, but it's crowdsourced, so eventually it'll be right. Yeah, so op 
op open trails, um, part of me wishes that like there was just public domain built into the spec, but the reality is you can't do that because then it won't be adopted. Um, but we do, um, the, the whole point of open trails is authoritative data coming from the agencies and we aggregate it together and that's actually just built into the spec. Like there's a license that goes with every, um, it's by organization. You can bundle up like 10 organizations into an open trail sort of download and each one of them can specify the license. We encourage public domain, like if somebody is ambivalent, we'll say, oh, just public domain and it's all good. Um, but like, you know, I, I, I wish that it could just be public domain and, and, and be done with it. But, if, you know, for adoption, when you're dealing with potentially like thousands of thousands of agencies, you just, you got to give them that choice. But, you know, it's built into that. So the metadata is there, at least in, in open trails, which I think seems like it was a good decision. So uh, any other questions? Yes. Sorry, right next to the aisle. Uh, open trails and transit land, are, are, were there any technical reasons for not using the open street map stack? And then from a licensing perspective, is there any conflation with existing uh, trail and transit information and how do you deal with that? Uh, so the fir first question, you want me to? Yeah, yeah. would you mind repeating? It? Yeah, so the first question I heard was basically why, um, to any technical reasons for not using the OpenStreetMap stack. And just to clarify, do you mean like just using OpenStreetMap as a platform or like using OpenStreetMap software? Just, just using OpenStreetMap proper to store the data. Cool. Um, and then the second question was, um, what was the second question? Conflating oh, conflation. And conflate, so conflation with, can, can you just repeat that? For example, did you import any existing trail information from OpenStreetMap and are you sending trail information back and forth between the two data sets? Yeah, okay, that, that one's easy. Um, that, the answer to that is like, no, we're not, act, we're not pulling data over from OSM because um, there are issues with that. Um, with a lot of the customers we work with. Um, the first part about the stack, um, it's kind of the same thing. Like, you know, we wanted to actually create a, another location that was just uh, potentially, you know, well, o Open Trails isn't really a location. Like, Open Trails, you know, it's just that spec that gives them, gives, gives like the agencies the ability to sort of publish this data in a way, but like the key was that that way was designed specifically to potentially get closer to OSM um, in the cases where that was going to be be possible. Um, so then, like the, the, it's, I'm kind of like balancing this like for our software for like outer spatial our platform. Um, you know, we're we're doing a bunch of other stuff like in addition to just the raw locations and you know, the relationships. So, you know, we wanted to have a, a place for all that stuff that without um, cramming it into figuring out how to get it into OSM potentially. So that was kind of like why we did that. But, you know, like I said, like we're, we're more than happy to try and facilitate that and, and like use, use it as much as we can and figure out creative ways to, to do that and show what's possible, so. Yeah, so in terms of the transit land project, uh, we have a, a loose coupling with OpenStreetMap data. We include, uh, we do conflate with OSM. Uh, in our data service, in our records, we'll say the closest OSM way to a stop in our own records. Uh, we'll, we'll also in the future uh, say like, if there is a stop on the OSM side, do that, that match up. Uh, the point isn't to uh, isn't to duplicate data, but to allow a crosswalk back and forth between services. In the the reason for for building up Transit Land as a a slightly separate data service is that uh, to really capture transit data properly, you need uh, to both be able to represent temporal data and you need to be able to represent the network. Of a, of a transit system 
and the OpenStreetMap data model uh, doesn't provide everything that's needed there. Like you couldn't. Um, uh, so part of part of what Transitland serves is it serves as a data source for routing engines that are going to route people on uh, on transit networks. Uh, the OpenStreetMap data model wouldn't give you everything you need to to represent a transit schedule and a network in a way that it could be fed into a, a routing engine. Actually, I have a comment on Transitland. A comment on Transitland. Mm -hmm. Like we're actually really at at um, Trailhead Labs, we're really excited about Transitland stuff because we see some of the innovations there in terms of um, like the, like ID systems and like you know out in the world there's no canonical ID for for these things and that causes a lot of issues. We got really excited when we saw the first pieces of Transitland coming out and some of the the way that they're tackling that because I think there's a lot of applicability to a lot of different um, kinds of um, specifically government data. Um, that are basically the same thing. It's like some geography and some metadata and maybe some, some schedules. And we're really excited to support that stuff and see where it goes. Because if it's if even just pieces of that work out, I think it's going to be good for a lot of different domains. Other questions from the audience? Okay, then I will I will pull a question out of the back of my head. Uh, if you were to draw a Venn diagram of OSM users and uh, the OSM community and a, a circle for your own uh, project and its users and its contributors, what would the overlap be between those two circles? So I can answer that from our side. Uh, we have about 25, 30% of our users that have some form of connection to OpenStreetMap as far as we could measure. Uh, I mean, it's hard to say right now because the data is new. But um, I would assume that um, people will find the data because they know of OSM. But once it gets more popular, I could see people that wouldn't be able to wrap their heads around the planet file use this data for their projects just because it's easier to grab the smaller subset um, and it's in a format that's easily presented on a map. So I could see that being um, you know, a, a relatively large percentage once the data set is relatively popular out there. The overlap directly is probably not very big, but oh, sorry, with open addresses. But um, the, in the future, I think, um, and probably right now, the, the users of open addresses data is, are probably uh, folks who are looking for that, this sort of address data in OpenStreetMap and not finding what they're looking for. Um, and I imagine if they're going as far as to, to find open addresses, they're probably uh, somebody who would be really excited about seeing that data in OpenStreetMap, in open addresses, in some website somewhere. So I think our users in open addresses are pretty um, pretty technical people who are very excited about open data. And I, I think that that's a pretty good chunk of people in OpenStreetMap as well. So I think that those are very similar people. Um, so I asked this earlier, but like, how many people here like to go outside and find things to do on OSM or ed do edits on OSM? Raise your hand. All right, so that's basically the Venn diagram for us. Um, I, I hope that there's a lot of overlap. My sense is that there is. I don't know what the exact numbers are, but it just seems like, you know, parks and recreation, and it's kind of just inherently very, you know, intertwined with what's going on in OSM. So I hope there's a bigger overlap over time. Oh, I'll, I'll borrow Jeremy's technique and ask, how many of you ride public transit? I ride public transit, yeah. I use OSM. I develop transit software. I, I would say we're, we're also in this situation of, of having, with Transitland, a decent amount of overlap in terms of audience with OpenStreetMap. Um, at the same time, uh, transit data has its own um, a unique history. Uh, the, 
about 10 years ago, the Portland area um, a transit agency worked together with Google to create a spec called GTFS for transit data and kind of laid down some tracks pretty early on in, in, in the open data world of standardizing around this spec of, of sharing transit data. And so uh, it's been about 10 years of, of this uh, transit data community coming together um, a bit in parallel with OSM. So it definitely overlaps, but um, uh, they have their own, own mailing lists, their own get-togethers, and hopefully with Transitland we'll be able to uh, draw some more connections between those two communities. A question in the back. BBN McHugh from TriMet in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> Hi guys. Um, I have a question about transit land and also one about addresses. Now, like with Open Trip Planner, um, it uses three different um, separate data sets. It uses um, OpenStreetMap, it uses the National Elevation data set, and it uses GTFS, which has all the transit information in it. And it does this to create a routable network. Again, like you said, because OpenStreetMap um, you know, by itself does not reside as one. So I'm interested in if that's what you're talking about with open, with, I'm sorry, with transit land, or if you're talking about um, more of a permanent integration of the transit data into OSM okay. for routing purposes. Sure, okay, so a so, uh, question is, is about, and please correct me if I'm not, not paraphrasing well. Uh, uh, so the Open Trip Planner, a, a, a nicely well-established uh, piece of open source software that can do multimodal routing. Uh, it draws in data from OpenStreetMap to do the pedestrian routing component. It draws in GTFS feeds from agencies, and it also draws in, uh, in elevation data sets brings all of this together and then uh, lets users um, plan a journey against that. Uh, and and uh, the, the question is, is Transitland trying to do a similar type of integration on kind of an ad hoc basis or more uh, uh, in a more permanent way? Uh, and uh, I'll just say we, we're really attempting to split the difference here of doing that type of integration work in a way that it can be shared across projects, shared across developers, uh, that it's possible to say, move from the IDs in one data set to another easily, uh, but not unnecessarily duplicate data where uh, we're not trying to bring GTFS feeds into OpenStreetMap proper where they would not be represented fully and they would get out of date. And, and likewise, we're also not trying to, to bring OpenStreetMap data directly into a, a, a transit feed or another data source where it also would get out of date and would raise uh, licensing issues. Uh, so I'd say in this respect, uh, transit land is, uh, is part of a pattern I'm hearing from a lot of these projects up here of looking for ways to bring data together from from OpenStreetMap, from some authoritative government sources, directly from some other user communities using different tooling, different mobile apps, and find ways to bring these data together uh, in a loosely coupled way, in a way that enables some new applications while maybe not, not creating new silos of, of data platforms. And with that, we just got the, the end sign. So I'd like to uh, thank all the panelists and please thank them as well. I appreciate their time being here. And thank you all for coming.